Hello. Thank you. Uh, I need a little liquid courage for this one. <sighs> My interest in food television, previous, you know, after Julia Child's PBS, Jacques Pepin, kind of came from Iron Chef Japan. I'm sure most of you here have seen Iron Chef Japan. As a, as a young cook, when I moved to California, I worked at Rubicon, and all the cooks would gather together, and we would go to this bar in Japantown. No one spoke English. It was true Japanese television. There was no subtitles. We had to figure out what the fuck was going on, and just pounding beer and screaming at the television. And after a while, we started getting the locals, to, the, the, the regulars were starting to translate for us and really make it a little more comfortable. Then Ron Siegel went on and won Battle Lobster. For us in California, it was huge. Finally, an American chef can go to Japan and win at Iron Chef. And then Iron Chef came to the United States. It was Iron Chef America. I'm a competitor. I was a professional bike racer for eight years. I love to compete. I love to win. So I thought, OK, let's give it a shot. Let's see if I can get on. Let's push. And I did it in Kanto for about three years. And then the phone rang. They called. I got to go. Battle Mario. Battle Garlic. I lost by the skin of my teeth. One point. Presentation. Kind of hurt. From that, just kept rolling. You know, you put yourself out there once. And then all these people start calling you. Nat Geo, Discovery, PBS. Everybody wants to talk to you. Oh, you're really funny. You, you say a lot of good things. You got really good sound bites. I fucking hate that word. You have really great <laughs> sound bites. How about a fucking great technique, you know? <laughs> so, from that, I'm asked to compete on the next Iron Chef. This is the first season, and we've got really amazing talent on there. John Besh, Michael Simon, Gavin Kaysen. I make it to the final three but I don't win, don't make it. All I want, I was like, man, I just wanna be the chef's chef. I wanna, I wanna fucking have that restaurant that all the chefs wanna come to. And for me, it was that opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I'm looking around at all these chefs that are on national television and their restaurants are busy. They're really busy. And I want my restaurant to be busy too. And I want cooks to wanna come work for me. And to do that, sometimes it's showcasing your skill set, And that's what I was trying to do with Iron Chef and, and next Iron Chef. But then a phone call came. A show had been created, and they asked me to be a co-host. I was asked to basically travel with a friend all over the US and compete. OK, I love free travel. My friend's really cool, and I get to compete. So I'm, I'm going to cook in all different cities. And you know, I've yet to have been to Chicago. OK, this is five years ago. I've never been to Chicago. So for me, I'm like, oh, fuck, I get to go to Chicago, I get to go home, I get to go back to Boston, I get to go to New England, and it just starts to roll. And the show, ultimately, go to another city, compete against some local talent. And again, I'm a co-star, I'm not the only one there. And I go to this city and I'm, I'm supposed to compete in a reality competition environment with my friend, and we're gonna compete against these great local chefs. So, city to city, Cooking, okay, I'm down. Sounds great. Then we go. Day one, hurry up and wait. Wake up, 5.30, on site, 6 o'clock, 10 o'clock, we start. So we're up pacing. This is what every day's like. You know, we have all sorts of environments that we're in. But then, as the show starts to progress, they catch on to little things, and then they tweak them. They find my learning disabilities. It's used against me. I'm dyslexic. I have ADD. Those of you who know me already know that. But I really didn't need the fucking entire world knowing that. I did not need the country knowing that. I didn't need to be poked at by it anymore. It wasn't really something I was proud of. I'd learned to work with it. As the show progressed, we were told we would be doing eating challenges. And to me, the way, this, the way I thought it was going to be was be a blind taste test. Let's blindfold you, give you all this food to taste. If you screw up, man, it's going to be pretty embarrassing if you can't tell the difference between a corn and a flour tortilla, you know? But that wasn't the case. You all saw what I had to do. Every city 
was a new challenge. Whether it was eating an extra large all meat deep dish pizza which weighed eight pounds, I had to eat snakes, testicles, okay, don't, yes, I cooked them at my restaurant, but I cooked them and I know how they're prepared. I had to eat three bowls of spicy chilies. I had to eat 10 pounds of baked beans, spicy Caribbean food with habaneros. I had to eat whole ghost chilies, 12 red hots with the works. I don't know the last time anybody's eaten a red hot. It's a lot of meat. It's about six ounces. Then you throw chili and sauerkraut and all this stuff on top. It really starts to add up. And then at some points, we would actually have to run a mile. I think at one point I ran a mile on a full stomach full of what you saw just a minute ago, which was 100-year-old eggs. I had to run a full mile, and it was 110 degrees out with all that jostling around in my guts. Really wasn't what I'd expected. But I signed up for it. There's the key. I signed up. Why do I continue to go back? I had all these people watching me. 50, excuse me. Every shoot there'd be about 50 people. Some of them just like you see here, all these big cameras. Some dude to be standing right next to you. Right here, in your face, giant camera. It's not really an option to stop. I signed a contract. How many of you have signed contracts? How many? Do you own homes? That's a contract. It's like a lease. You bought a car. You have to pay for it. I signed a contract. That contract says, I will c continue to do this show. I will follow through with my commitment. As a cook, we're taught, right? We're taught to follow through with task at hand, commit to the job, right? Don't you hate that? Everybody here complains when their cooks bail out, right? You got a stagiaire, he comes in for five minutes, like, you know, chef, this is a little too much work for me. It's not what I was expecting. <laughs> I gotta go home. My cat's sick. And your, your instant response is, fuck you, get out. <laughs> and it's the truth, it happens, you know? And, and I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be the non-commitment. I didn't want to be that guy that just quit. I had a partner, I had a teammate. I don't want to abandon my teammate, right? No man standing alone. We all work in that team, no I in team. So, we go through, we go through seven, do a seven season, or a seven episode season first. And we get to take a break. They wanna do test studies. How is this gonna work out? How are people gonna enjoy the show? Is it fun, do people like it? Is it worth doing again? I get to see the show for the first time August 7th, 2009, five years ago. My son, my wife, my friends, they all come to the restaurant. We're gonna show it at the restaurant. I have no idea, I haven't seen it, I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen the finals, there's no previews of it. I, I was bummed, disappointed. I was ashamed. I'd gone from city to city, I looked like a fucking bully. I looked like that kid who's in senior class who loves to fuck with the freshmen. I looked like a royal cunt, and I hated it. I hated everything about it. I hated the fact that I went to a town and I made two local chefs feel bad, look bad. We're making the town look bad. They wanted their opportunity to be on television to promote their business and their restaurant. They wanted an opportunity to shine. And who the hell am I to come to their town and shit all over them? And it wasn't my intention. I just, just, just went that way. You know, competition's competition, right? You always have those assholes that say second place is always the first loser. I didn't really agree with that, you know? Bike racing, different story. It's bike racing. These are people's lives. This was my life. 
This was their life. And, and I'm saying to myself, how in the hell did I go from being all about conviviality to being all about, let's destroy these two fucking kids? It's not, it's not what I am. When people come to my restaurant, I want them to have a good time. This was supposed to be a good time. It's supposed to be fun. You know, good old-fashioned competition is great. You know, we got to do everything from milk goats to break down whole wheels, 125 pound wheels of Parmesan with traditional tools. To me, that was what would be a good competition. Do you know how to break down a whole wheel of Parmesan? Yes, I do. Let's do it. Boom, boom, boom. Not how much food you can stuff down your throat. Not make somebody look embarrassed because they may have never butchered a lamb before hanging. I had, I'd spent a long time educating myself. I didn't, wasn't happy with how I presented myself. The show had a bunch of issues that I brought to the attention of management, legally what I can say. Um, food challenges, disrespectful not only to the restaurant, businesses, and all competitors at hand. Who wants to eat like that, right? I'm not fucking Joey Chestnut, neither is anybody else. And we're not gonna do the Nathan's hot dog challenge. We're encouraging bad habits, really bad habits. Um, one of which I just mentioned was that eating competition, but for me, the eating competition became a huge issue. I went to pick my son up. At this time, he's pre-K. He's at school, and I have to pick him up early to take him to a doctor's appointment. I show up at school, and the kids are feverishly running around the playground, building fucking sandcastles, climbing, you know, climbing their play structure, and then they're trying to find like tools they've buried. And I asked the teacher, Miss Julie, what are they doing? They're playing your show. They're playing my show. Okay, cool, they're having fun. Then they all run into the classroom and try to eat their lunch as fast as humanly possible. I, my heart sunk. I've never felt so low about myself. I'm ashamed to talk about this. It's very hard for me not to be angry. Chris and I have had a lot of conversations about this, about me not being angry because I made this choice. I'm more angry at myself for letting this happen. I have a lot of pages here, so bear with me, okay? Oh. <laughs> you know, after the conversations were had with management, my opinion was heard. And just like when you talk to a teenager, it goes in here and falls right out here. Nobody cared. Ratings were fucking great. Really love it when you eat. Great. We're moving on with the next season. Seven are done. Total, it's 23. You do the math. How many more have I got to go? I gotta go forward. So I do. Had a partner. He was a little bit more savvy than I was. Never made waves. It's actually been really good for him. I'm really happy for him. It worked out. I was the one who always ate. I was always the one who took it on. Just didn't really work for him. You know, he couldn't handle the heat. For some reason or another, I could. I ate whole ghost chilies. La Sinai dish that I had. It's a, uh, from a Muslim Chinese restaurant. It had 36 chilies in it. 36 in one dish. That was this big, four ounces. All different varieties. It's not fun. But I did it, because I fucking signed up for it. You know, people say, what, why, why did you do it? What's, what, did, what did the show do for me? Um, well, for one, I'm not rich, guys. Anybody out there that thinks food TV is gonna make you fucking wealthy, you are high, okay? I sure don't look like Brad Pitt. I haven't been chased by zombies recently in any movies, so 
the, that money thought process because you're on television, it doesn't really exist. But the instant perception versus reality problem you have is you're never in your restaurant anymore. You don't care. You're on fucking TV. And that was the farthest stretch from the truth because I felt guilty I wasn't at my restaurant. I would go to work in the morning, take my son to school. My wife would drop me off at work with my luggage at 8.30 in the fucking morning. I would work all day prepping, go through half of dinner service, get on an overnight flight, land where I was shooting, shoot all fucking day, wake up the next morning at six, do my voiceovers for those great sound bites, and then get on a plane, fly home, get in a cab with my luggage, go straight back to the restaurant and work fucking dinner service. It was three days, then off for four, three days, off for four. So ultimately, I was really only gone for one day. And then I worked even more when I was home because I felt guilty. I felt that I was not helping my staff. There would be issues at the market. I was, there was things muttered to my wife. People would talk shit about me in front of my child. Sell out, chef. What is fucking selling out? Anybody here have an idea? Because in punk rock, you're a sellout. In hip hop, you're fucking blowing up. So I don't understand. Why can't somebody work to try to put braces on their fucking kid's teeth? I was trying to take an opportunity to better my business, give opportunities to my family and to my staff. I wanted to grow a business. I wanted to give opportunities to sous chefs. I was hoping that television would give me that influx of cash to allow me to open another restaurant, to then take that great sous chef who'd been super fucking loyal and give him the next opportunity. But that whole thing just kind of ran out. But other than all that, there was bigger picture, bigger problem. My health. I got really fucking sick. That's my stomach in 2009 with third degree alkaline burns. This is my stomach four weeks ago. That's normal. That's not. I have lesions, holes. They said it looked like I swallowed a fucking Wolverine and it tried to scratch itself out. <laughs> Trust me, it's not fucking funny because I spent days on the shitter. I spent fucking days being really sick. I couldn't drink alcohol for over a year. I couldn't eat acidic food. I couldn't eat tomato sauce. For fuck's sake, I run an Italian restaurant. How can I not taste a fucking tomato sauce? I couldn't drink red wine. I still don't drink red wine anymore. I went to do an event, I got two minutes, I'll make it fast. I went to do an event in New York, June 2009. I flew back home from New York after doing this dinner. I got off the plane, I got in a taxi, went straight to the restaurant where my business partner rushed me to the emergency room where I was admitted. They thought I had appendicitis. They were ready to have immediate surgery because they thought my appendix was gonna explode but the blood work showed that they were wrong. Then they recognized that I was extremely distended. This t-shirt would have looked like a fucking sausage casing. It was so big. My neck and my head looked like it was just part of my shoulders. I was all one. It was huge. They, looked, they said if I'd hit me with a pin, I would have popped like a fucking balloon. Rushed me upstairs. I was filled with what is called acetus. Does anybody know what acetus is? Acetus can only come from two things. Cirrhosis of an organ or cancer. My blood work said my liver was fine. So what do you think they told me? I was told I had cancer. Nobody can take that away. Nobody can take away that fucking moment in my life. My wife was on vacation in Virginia with my son. My business partner almost had a heart attack. I didn't have fucking 
Life insurance? Who the hell would have thought that I would get fucking sick like that? No idea. They're ready to, you know, bring me right in. I had fucking cameras up both ends at the same time. The whole nine. I've been going to doctors for five years trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Third degree alkaline burns. I'm sure everybody's seen a burn victim, right? You know what their skin looks like on the outside? Most burn victims can't even be in the sun because the nerve endings are so fucking roached. The nerve endings were roached so bad in my stomach that I had what was called motility issues. Motility is when the food in your stomach can't be processed or pushed forward into your intestines. And then it sits and ferments. Once it ferments, everybody knows about fermentation here, I hope, um, it creates gas. And not the kind of gas you're gonna fart either. I'm talking gas that hurts because your intestines fill up like balloons. Picture filling Cote de Quino and casings. Where are you, Dario? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Filling those sausage casings and they just get fatter and fatter until they want to fucking pop. That's what, I was, that's what was happening to me. And nobody knew. You know, fame, my goal to get busy, to open another restaurant, fame hurt. It's not all it's cracked up to be. All I wanted to do was have a busy restaurant, take care of my staff, take care of my family. So now, five years later, I'm very fortunate that I found a really amazing doctor. She's got me back on track. We actually think that my stomach is fully healed. I am training with a trainer to have motility improvement. I don't think you guys need to look at that shit anymore. Can we make that thing go away? <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> Why go into TV? If somebody like that would do that to you. A lot of it for me was ego. Like I said, I wanted to be somewhere, be somebody. I was a kid with ADD, was dyslexic, you know, divorced family, told I wasn't gonna amount to shit. So this was my way to stick it to everybody that said, you can't fucking do it. So I'm gonna get on TV, fuck you. I'm gonna show you I can do this. I'm gonna go on TV and show you all I, I'm not gonna amount to shit. I can do anything I want. Well, it was a wrong way to think. It really was. I think, looking back, I should have listened to my fucking wife. Never done it. I let people down. I let down my team, I let down my family. My wife had to put up with this shit for five years. Me being sick, me traveling for the two years that I did all this crap. The worst thing it did was it made me fear everything moving forward. It made me be concerned about what everybody thought of me. Because it did have backfire. The whole sellout thing, the restaurant fucking, we lost 45% of sales because I was a sellout. I wasn't in my restaurant, so nobody wanted to come anymore. It changed the game. It all looks glorious from the fucking outside, but it wasn't. I'm a very different person now. I'm not, uh, I'm not rushing to do anything like that anymore soon. But it did make me fearful, and it changed the way I cook, which I think uh, was the worst thing of all. I was afraid to be myself anymore, so I was afraid to be judged being called a sellout for trying to take care of my family and make my restaurant busier went pretty far. That being said, as a cook, you're taught how to set up your station. You're taught how to brunoise. Chef Pierre showed everybody how to clean an artichoke, how to debone a pig's trotter. I had nobody to show me how to deal with this shit. I didn't know. And I'm hoping that down the future, if anybody here the next generation has opportunities that one really looks at those opportunities with other eyes. Take some help. Get a mentor. I know it's a new world. This is a new world you need a mentor in. There's chef mentors, and then there's TV chef mentors. Whee! Who the fuck would have thought? I never expected to be on television. It wasn't my dream. But I did it. And now I'm here. 42, my restaurant's closed, starting over again. Whole new life. Gonna build up 
what I want my way. And I think that's the most important thing. So thank you.